Hello, I'm Dr. Clay Brashears. This is Why Parallel? Why Now? Part 1 of our Introduction to Parallel Programming series. So at the end of this module, you should be able to define what parallel computing is and explain why parallel computing is becoming mainstream. So what can you do with a faster computer? Well, the first thing you can obviously do is to solve your problem faster. If you've got a very large job that takes a long time to execute, if you can run that on a faster computer, it'll take you less time to actually run that big job. In the case of interactive applications, it'll increase the responsiveness. You'll get better turnaround and better interaction with those applications. The second thing you can do is to get better solutions in the same amount of time. You may have a case where your data set is too large to fit on the current technology. If you had a faster computer, you could run that larger model and do it in the same amount of time that it would take to run a smaller data set case. This allows you to increase the resolution of models, say for weather prediction or things like that. You can also make your model more sophisticated, add more processing, add more physics, add more things to the model that the faster computer can now take advantage of. So what about parallel computing? Well, parallel computing is actually an attempt to speed up your solution of a particular task by doing certain things. One of those things is dividing your task into subtasks that are much smaller than the whole larger task, and then being able to execute those subtasks simultaneously on multiple cores. If you're going to be successful in dividing up a computation and running it in parallel, you have to do two things. First, you have to understand where the parallelism can be most effective, and then have some knowledge of how to design and implement a good solution. Now, these are the topics that we're going to talk about in the rest of the parts for this Introduction to Parallel Programming series. So why parallel computing? Well, the famous quote I think that sums this up comes from Herb Sutter when he said the free lunch is over. And what he meant by that was that the clock speeds are no longer going to be increasing exponentially. As you can see from the graph, clock speeds have doubled every 18 months to two years, according to Moore's law. But we're not going to be able to sustain that growth any longer. And still, we want our applications to run and execute faster and faster. So why is it that clock speeds have flattened out? Well, with higher speeds come different problems. One is excessive power consumption. It takes more power to drive a processor faster and faster. There's also the case of heat dissipation. If you're running more current through a processor, you're going to get hotter and hotter, and you have to deal with that heat some way. And as you put more power into a processor, the leakage between the wires in the processor actually increases, and so you're becoming less efficient in your use of that power. For mobile devices like laptops or netbooks, power consumption has become a critical factor. We want to increase the battery life of our devices and make sure that they'll last longer on a single charge. Mobile computing platforms are becoming increasingly important, as we've seen with the explosion of laptops and netbooks over the last few years. Now, there are several other ways besides parallelism that we can use to try and optimize or increase our performance of applications. Things like instruction prefetching. If we can know what the next instruction is going to be that we're going to execute, we can make sure that part of our processing is to go out and fetch that instruction before we need it. Instruction reordering may actually take instructions and put them in a different order than you wrote them in your serial code. If instructions have their operands available and ready, they should be allowed to execute, whereas instructions that don't have their operands available should be left behind until they do have those operands available. This will increase your performance in the application. If you pipeline your functional units, this allows you to have multiple instructions in flight at the same time that will increase your performance. Branch prediction attempts to prefetch the instructions and the data along one of the paths of your conditional expression, and if it guesses correctly, it's ahead of the game. If not, well, then you have to go back and redo it. If you have multiple functional units, you can be doing uh, integer operations and, say, memory allocation and floating point operations at the same time, which again will increase your performance. And finally, hyperthreading takes advantage of those multiple functional units. If one thread or one process is not taking advantage of all of the functional units, and there's, another func and there's another process that can use those functional units that aren't being used, we can merge those streams together and execute two processes at the same time using those different functional units. So all of these things are nice, except there's not a lot of cases where the programmer can actually directly affect them. They're all devoted to hardware. As we add sophistication to the hardware itself, we require more and more silicon be devoted to these things that are controlling the hardware. The prefetchers, the branch predictors, the hyperthreading allocation. So what can we do with multiple hardware? Well, one of the things is we can add more cores to that hardware. So the strategy behind multi-core architectures is to be able to limit the core speed and therefore avoid some of those problems that we've discussed earlier and decrease the sophistication. We know how to build a core, but we don't have to put in all the fancy, fancy bells and whistles. 
And that way we can put multiple cores onto the single chip. Now, if you look at the graph on this slide, you can approach this in two different ways. One is to uh, keep the speed constant, so along the vertical axis we have multiple cores added. So if I keep the speed constant at one, I'm at the far left, and one core at one speed or relative one speed is going to give me a performance of one. If I double the number of cores, my potential performance is going to be two. So I've got the core speed of one times two cores gives me a two. If I create a, a four core machine and I keep the speed constant, I'm going to get four cores and the performance is going to be up to four X. If I go along the, the speed horizontal axis, then I uh, keep the same number of cores, I can double the speed of my processor and therefore get twice as much computation done. Or if I quadruple the speed of my processor, I can get four times as much done. If I sort of go in between both of these, if I increase the speed a little bit and use some of the uh, space on the chip to give me more cores, I can get, say, a speed up of two if I double the speed. And if I increase the number of cores by two, now again, my performance is two times two or four. So as we point out here, more cores at the same speed or faster processors or a combination of both can give me the same potential performance on new multi-core architectures. And this slide illustrates some of the old thinking that we had about parallel computing. Starting at the top, parallel computers are expensive. Well, yes, back in the day, uh, they were very expensive and only a few companies in national labs had the chance to get them and buy them. If we go down along the right side, this leads to things like there are not many parallel computers. Well, they're so darn expensive, I can't buy too many and I can't produce so many. Most people do not learn parallel programming. Well, if I only have a few computers out in the wild, there's not going to be too many people that are going to be able to actually use them or program with them. Continuing on up through the left, parallel computing is not in the mainstream. Again, if only a few people have them, they're the only ones that really have them. They're not available to everybody else out in the real world. Parallel programming environments are inadequate. Yeah, back in the old days, you didn't really have a whole lot of people that were demanding the best and the greatest and new technology to make their parallel programming easier. And this, of course, leads to making parallel programming difficult there on the lower right-hand corner. And that's what we're trying to fix. So what about you? How would you approach parallel computing? Well, one way is to maybe take a sequential language approach. Your problem may have inherent parallelism in it. But because you're programming with a sequential language, you cannot actually express that parallelism. So the programmer actually is hiding the parallelism in the sequential constructs that you have to use. Then you might leave it up to the compiler or the hardware that has to now go in and dig into your code and find that hidden parallelism. And a lot of times it, it really just doesn't work. An alternate approach is to get the programmer, yourself, and the compiler to try and work together. Now again, if your problem has inherent parallelism, the programmer is given a way to express that parallelism and then it's up to the compiler to take those hints that are given to it by the programmer to translate that code and make it into a parallel application that can be run on multiple cores. This is really not so strange because programmers of modern CPUs really have to take the architecture and the compiler into account when they're trying to get peak performance. What sorts of register sizes do I have? Well, how much cache is there? What's the memory bus architecture? Things like that have to be uh, thought of, at least, when you're developing and designing programs. And same thing with the compiler. Modern compilers now have the capability to take hints given by the programmer and easily turn your code into a parallel application. So how has this all changed the dynamic of parallel computing? With multi-core processors now, PCs are parallel computers. Your desktop is a parallel computer. Your laptop is a parallel computer. Your netbook is a parallel computer. Everyone has a parallel computer. So now more people are learning to do parallel programming to support these new platforms. Parallel programming is now becoming mainstream. And of course, parallel programming environments are going to improve because more people are going to be doing parallel programming and demanding easier and better ways to do it. This will all lead to parallel programming getting easier. The references shown here will give further information on the topics covered in this part. In this module, we've done a little bit of a definition for parallel computing and tried to explain why parallel computing is now becoming mainstream. In part two, we're going to talk about ways that you can divide your serial code into subtasks that can be done in parallel.